Speaker, our final speaker is uh, Neil Hannes. Uh, I have been working with Neil with Kamehameha Schools um, with the Land Assets Division. And uh, I, I really, in thinking through this panel, John and I wanted to have somebody from a nonprofit, the, those of us who run internship programs, to a federal um, uh, representative, but also somebody from a landowner perspective as well. Um, and uh, who's uh, in and Kamehameha Schools has just been. Um, so impressive over the last several years of their investment and interest in these kinds of programs. So, um, Neil. Well, my kako pakahia pao, and mahalo Sharon uh, for inviting me here and being on this panel, and uh, mahalo to the other panelists for God wonderful presentations. I'm I'm humbled to to be standing here with you. Hope I have something to contribute. Uh, Sharon, when you ask a uh, Hawaiian. To introduce themselves, you're going to need more than 20 minutes. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> it tends to get into name and ancestry and ancestors and uh, place and uh, kuleana. And I thought about that, obviously, uh, but I didn't think that would optimize uh, the time I have to contribute to this particular forum topic. Uh, so let's just say I direct the Land Assets Division of Kamehameha Schools. It's, it's, a, it's an honor to, to do that, to, to have some responsible care of uh, Kelly Polahi's assets, work with a wonderful team, uh, many of them who are here. These assets are, are agricultural conservation lands on five islands, and the acreage is about 347,000 acres on these islands. In thinking about what I was gonna, how I was going to contribute to this forum, uh, you've I'm afraid I'm not going to do what Sharon asked. Since you break the rules, I guess we can break the rules as well. Uh, uh, we've heard a lot about what, and we've got a lot of what's at Kamehameha, our Aina Ulu program. Uh, we do work with Pono Pacific. We do have interns. We do work with UHIP. Uh, we have research, ongoing research by graduate students and others on our land. As you heard yes, uh, two days ago from Gretchen Daly, we're undertaking kind of a, a role in this natural capital project with Stanford University. And we have a very exciting First Nation Futures program. And uh, I thought about that there was a lot of what's to talk about, but you've heard a lot about what's. And I'm not the best source for what anyway. We have Namaka Whitehead here at the conference. We have uh, Ulu, uh, Ulalia Woodside, Kama Dansel. We have one of our First Nation Futures fellows, Noah Lincoln here from, uh, from the Amy Greenwell Gardens. Uh, they can answer what's a lot better than I can uh, in the details of these things. We have other people not at this conference that I know you know, Mawai Morton, Mahilani Matsuzaki, Kaeo Duarte, Peter Simmons. Uh, we have collateral material and we have websites. So there's a lot of place to get the, the information about what and what we're doing. I wanted to talk about why. And there's a couple of people, I see a couple uh, constituencies represented in this audience. And uh, one are people who could help build this bridge to the future. And I want to talk to you about why should we build the bridge as landowners, as agencies, and so forth. And I see a lot of young people who raise their hands and, and who are really are the future. And I want to talk to you about why cross that bridge, why go there. And so, and, and I, I, my rejoinder at the start of this is, is, is a very Kamehameha perspective. Uh, Kamehameha schools perspective, Hawaiian perspective, and so forth, and, and I hope it resonates with this whole audience, uh, but it's how we feel and it's the contribution we can make. I like that question. When did Hawaiians become Hawaiians? It kind of tips the hand right away. Uh, 
I wish I were more worthy to answer that question. I think it's a good one. I see Kana uh, Keala Kanaka Ole over there, and I'd love to hear what his uh, ohana would have to say about that question, uh, probably give a much deeper answer. But just let me share with you some of my mana'o and how it kind of leads us to the topic at hand. We know this. Our ancestors got on canoes from in other places, in the Marquesas and Tahitian, and so they're not from this place. They came here. You know, they were not Hawaiian on arrival. As, 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 as uh, life-changing as a voyage might be, they were probably still Marquesas and Tahitian when they got off the boat. But this place influenced them. We have unique weather patterns, that's a vapor trail and, and so forth, uh, that really kind of create an environment here that really started to shape our values, and we see those values expressed in our olelo no eao, like ue kalani olo kahonua, that recognizes the wetness and the, uh, the value of water here. They, they situated themselves on their lands, and they named the elements of the land and the landscape, and they knew where they should be and where other resources should be on this landscape. They adapted their behavior to the climatology of this place, the botanical cycles and biological cycles. You've seen our tide charts, you've seen our lunar calendars. It cracked me up a few years ago. I went to Napa Valley and all these guys were talking about bragging about their winemaker and bragging about their biodynamism consultant. I said, what is that? Hey, we found out when we plant the, the vines under certain lunar cycles, they grow better. So, wow, what a concept. You know, we were, I think our kupuna understood that quite well. There are many practices that we have here, cultural practices that really are all over Polynesia. And a good a mentor of mine, uh, really privileged, uh, Donald Kilolani Mitchell, you know, from years back, and I know some of you uh, are uh, people in our audience might re remember Kilo, used to have this uh, slide program in the days when you really had slide programs like yours, Hannah, that ka-chink, 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 not PowerPoint, uh, called Cultural Peaks. And he used to just brag and feel so proud that uh, whatever was going on in Polynesia in terms of cultural practices, Hawaiians kicked it up a notch and, and really refined the art. And I think we were able to do that partially because of the resources of place. And we developed u unique practices as well. We developed a genealogical connection with this, these lands. These are not just lands. We are really you know, connected to these lands by genealogy because we buried the bones of our ancestors in these lands. You've heard of the phrase kulaivi. It's these fields in which the bones of our ancestors are buried. That changes one. That changes our relationship to place. And we left etchings on the land. I love that word, etchings. Uh, I'll credit the source of that in a few minutes. But here in this picture of, of Honau now, you not only see, I mean, underlying there, some of which you can't see, you drive right by, are battlefields and field systems and forests and a city of refuge, Pu'uhonua, you know, that are very, that really reflect the presence, of the prior existence and presence of our ancestors. So we became Hawaiian, I think, when these things made us distinct from our Marquesan and Tahitian uh, cousins, when they all kind of added up and, and say, okay, we're different. We're related, but different. The real question is, why does it matter? And the guy who left that etchings thing is a man named Joe Williams. Uh, if you're privileged to know him, he's, you know, he's a great, great guy. He's the chief judge of the Maori Land Court in Waitangi Tribunal, a Maori. And he said, we in the land, we're born of the land. The thought that we would own the land is a nonsense. If anything is owned, it's us. And we are the land are one and the same. And under the herbs and grasses are the etchings of my ancestors, and each that goes missing is like a knife in my culture. A knife in my culture, and something that I need to know about who I am also goes missing. So what's happened to us? We lost our connection with the land. With the depopulation in the 19th century, uh, all the deaths with urbanization and changes in, in uh, economy, uh, economic structures, so we move from subsistence and being on the land and present to big pastures and big plantations and so forth. It really reduced the number of people who were connected to the land, and much went missing. This is a wonderful picture. Uh, I, I steal a lot of photos. That's, I, I told Hannah, I said, one thing about your slideshow, I cannot steal the, I cannot steal the intellectual property that as easily as uh, when I download somebody's PowerPoint onto my computer. And this is from Peter Batusik, a good friend uh, of the uh, Kohala Field System. And uh, you know, we took systems like this, and fortunately there's some residue remnant of this that still remains that you can see in this picture, but uh, we allowed cattle or we, we chain dragged it and so forth to really uh, alter the etching that was on that land. 
So Pauahi took action to help. Obviously, she was a woman of, of compassion and leadership in, in her time, and she took that action to help. And, and I, I raised this, why am I here? What are we doing now today that relates back to her mission? But most of the models available to her, most of the strategies and systems available to her at her time, in, when she dies in 1884, are uh, really Western. Our system was so dysfunctional because of depopulation and breakdown that she really couldn't go to those models in her school and in her strategy. And so our original model of, of, of education strategy was really about assimilation. Our original model of asset, uh, for asset management strategy was about maximizing the bucks. And if you had enough money, if you went from being land rich and cash poor to being more cash, cash full, you know, you can buy stuff. You can buy cultural stuff and buy educational programs and so forth. And so our lands were developed, like these lands in Kaneohe, to creating a cash flow. And that cash flow created wealth over our 120 years of existence. And at the end of last fiscal year, not this immediately past fiscal year, we were at $7.6 billion in terms of asset valuation in our endowment. And look at that, that uh, weighting now. It's three-fourths of it's coming from financial instruments. And that puts us in a position to make different decisions today uh, and, and to look at how we go forward, that bridge to the future in terms of this cash security and, and liquidity that a Liliuokalani Trust cannot make. They're so heavily reliant on their lands uh, you know, the, the, to make the payroll for the children's center that they, they have to make dis different decisions. They have a different context. And this has enabled this cash, this rich, uh, uh, richness of Kala has really enabled us to extend our educational reach, to have three campuses, all these preschools, to have scholarship programs and charter school alliances, to serve 28,000 full-time learners a year and 15,000 others that, that we touch in other ways, to spend over $220 million, and that's rising a year on, on education. But all that does, when you think about a Hawaiian population base of over 400,000 globally, of 260,000 uh, locally, is just whet the appetite for more. Now my turn. Is it finally my turn? It's like the Hawaiian homes list. Is it finally my turn to be served, to get into one of those programs, whether it's a campus or a preschool or some other program? And when you have that pushing on you, that expectation to do more, if we were to go back to the old strategy of economic maximization, this is the kind of thing that would crop up. This is a 1955 plan for uh, monetizing to create wealth. To take the Heia fish pond, Pawahi's very first inheritance from her father, Abner Paki, a, a cultural treasure, an engineering feat of genius, and destroy it by, so we could make marina lots to get a cash flow. That was the strategy that passed, and it was clearly inappropriate. And the people who told us that it was inappropriate, probably many of you in this room over my 33 years of being at Kamehameha, you know, our own stakeholders. They say, fine, you're going to make more money, but money doesn't buy back everything it destroys in the process. You know, is this what the end game looks like for us? And if you go back to who we are, why we are, how we came to be as a unique people, What's there to remind us of that, if this is what the end game looks like? And besides which, we've been doing this over 120 years, and we still have a crisis of well-being. You know, we haven't solved the problem yet, so we're going to go forward in the next 100, 100 years or so and thinking that the same strategy will produce a different result. Let's take, have the courage to consider new strategies. And that's what our strategic plan of, of the year 2000 uh, letting it, leading up to 2000 really enabled us to do. And I wish the problem ended there, or the challenge ended there. But now, because of where we are in time and space, uh, we're, we're faced with another crisis, a growing crisis of, of sustainability. And again, I credit some of our colleagues from Stanford for, for some of these, this mana'o and, and some images. 50% of our ice-free land has been transformed on this earth. Let's talk first at the macro level. Uh, we've used and accessed more than half of our fresh water supply. They're now talking about taking uh, the glacial melt icebergs and dragging them to places and melting them down so we can drink it. This is uh, fortunately not Hawaii, but that's the Yaki River Basin in Mexico, a 10-year ten ten view of how they've kind of just drained that water. I heard the Hoover Dam was down 180 feet 
uh, in terms of its normal height, from its normal height. I heard the Great Lakes region of, of our continent is uh, banded together because they've seen what's happened to the Colorado River system, and now they want to already, step, uh, before anybody starts to suck the Great Lakes dry, they say, you know, we want to have some control and say so over this. These are the greenhouse gases from Inconvenient Truth and Al Gore and all those that uh, methane and carbon dioxide and nitrous oxide and sulfur that's being emitted uh, since the industrial age, causing impacts we can't see and accumulation of CO2 in the atmosphere, changing our oceans and breaking down our, our fisheries and causing the potential at risk of uh, a rise in sea level. By the way, folks, I finally figured out the uh, federal scientists uh, I got their mana'o finally as to why they will never believe there will be a rise in sea level. Since the earth is flat, the water goes off the edge. <laughs> so it cannot, it cannot possibly rise. So you just, you know, study your science and you'll kind of catch up with them. And of course we have our local issues too. Ungulates that are out of control. I see Ronnie Kimball back there from Molokai who's uh, helped us with this issue, Eddie Masaki and those guys from TNC who, who've, who've helped to, to, to integrate active subsistence hunting and so forth to reduce the goat population that is denuding the land and causing that erosion that's killing the reef, the Kamalo. We have in the past, and I'm glad to say the clear-cut side of this is not ours, but uh, there's been too much in our history of clear-cutting a forest. We, I look at in, with great embarrassment and, and chagrin at leases that we have that, that required our pasture lessees to chain drag and weed the land of Ohia and Pukeave and those plants so we could put in a, a plant of value, grass, and, and get pastures out of these lands. We have, of course, the rodents that I think you, I saw, you had a lot of rodents uh, sessions. So I, don't, I don't think I need to dwell on that, or weed sessions, uh, stream diversions. I don't know how much you talked about water in, this, in these uh, three days, but uh, certainly we know that, uh, you know, our ancestors diverted water from streams too, but they usually put it back. Uh, and they left water in the stream. You look at these stream diversions of our plantation systems, and, and they were so efficient at low flow, they took everything and put it onto a field. Because the basic view and the value of that time was that water in a stream going out to the ocean was wasted. So we have two crises, a crisis of well-being uh, and a crisis of sustainability that we're, we're facing. And again, go back to the messages to you who are being, whose well-being is affected, either current well-being or future well-being. I go back to, to, to my audience here in terms of the, those of you who can make a contribution to the crisis of sustainability. I actually think these two things solve for one another. That's, that's the go forward move at, at Kamehameha in our land assets division anyway, is to, is to have one solve for the other. That if we could link our people, reconnect our people back to land, that's gonna address some of the crisis of identity and well-being. We'll know who we are. If we can, and, and if we can link our cultural values to the management of land, we'll, bet we'll improve the sustainability of those lands and resources. So it's again, we look upon these lands as aina mole, a mole is taproot, a place to really sink one's taproot into the land, you know, to draw spiritual and cultural and educational nourishment. And to really, in reconnecting that, become people of place, caring for place. And the programs that we've talked about in all these, my colleagues here uh, on the panel, really help us be prepared for that challenge and enable that, that mission. And then thereby really ho'olu lahui and ho'olu uh, kako aina, where we transform the well-being of our our well, ourselves and our environment. So we're, we're embarking since uh, 2000 across our institution on, uh, with, uh, on a mission with new strategies guiding us. Uh, a new educational strategy that's not only out here on the land but within all our campuses and programs is really let's start to not just learn about ourselves as a cultural people but learn through culture and to practice and integrate culture in our day-to-day -day lives. That creates a very different role for a place like Hey, a fish pond. And I, th I th was, uh, no, not at this conference, at the conference I was at yesterday. We've had, I, there may be Pai Pai Ohea folks here, just a wonderful team of, of people who really kind of re revitalized that pond. And if you've never been to Hey, a fish pond, I invite you to check it out and see what's going on over there. And how, it's not just like all these programs that uh, my colleagues have talked about here, it's not just learning about the pond per se, it's using the pond to learn math and science and, and language art skills and just about anything we, we want to address in our education system. 
and really come up with a new asset management strategy. Uh, initially, we had another image here, uh, and I credit Noah Lincoln and our First Nation Futures Fellows. See, I'm listening to you, Noah. You know, we're, you've, made it, you've made a difference uh, already. We kind of had these concentric circles of, uh, we said, we want to balance our return. Remember my, my economics, culture, stewardship, education? So we had these things. Let's overlap them. And that'll show how we're trying to balance and put our community in the middle of creating this new kind of wealth that is about education and culture and economics and so forth. It's really about moving from kala as a metric to vai vai. And our uh, fellows, when they were dealing with us, uh, uh, five Hawaiian, four Maori uh, young adults in, in our fellowship program, uh, said, you know, you're treating culture like an independent variable that can be traded off against the others. We well, don't feel too good about that. You know, we don't want to be trading off that if you have enough money, what, we, we give up something culture, of cultural value? I don't think so. So they gave us a wonderful new image of this kalo and saying at the core of this kalo, at the base of it, is culture, is who we are. If that is strong, everything grows healthily out of that. The lao will be nice and big and robust. The lao of education, the lao of economics, the lao of well-being, the lao of environmental care and stewardship. Beautiful concept, and we mahalo our, uh, our fellows for kind of helping us think through this in, in another way. And thereby then look at, take with that value system, with that strategy, start to look at our lands, our 174,000 acres of agricultural land, our 170,000 acres of conservation land, and say, you know, we really need to start migrating in this post-plantation era toward food security and fuel independence and using our aina momona for those purposes to put food on the table of our people and the people at Pai Pai Ohe'eya, the people, our folks, our partners at Waipa, Stacy Sprout folks, are really moving in that direction and reopening uh, lo'i and so forth and recultivating food on the land, not for, purely for commercial purposes, although maybe some, there may be some monetary transaction involved, uh, contribution and so forth. It's really about putting food on our table and, and growing our food again. And we're looking at this whole biofuel things. I know all the controversy of biofuels, and you had a session on alternative energy the other day. At best, it's probably an interim measure, but it starts to get us to think about, you know, creating more energy independence and reducing reliance on fossil fuels. And Kamehameha is very heavily involved through Maui Morton, our Hawaii Bioenergy Alliance with people, Randy's boss over, uh, uh, over there uh, at Maui Land and Pine and so forth, to really look not only at ethanol and so forth, but also at alternative energy sources like wind and solar and inline hydro and so forth. To look at our, that's all those conservation lands as aina vai vai, and as, a, as you heard from Gretchen Daly two days ago, you know, all those ecosystem services, the production of, of goods and commodities, the, the, the satisfaction or fulfillment of life supporting services, life fulfilling services, and, and, uh, and preservation of options that Stanford's looking at in their ecosystem services, you know, these can occur and should occur uh, in our in our aina vai vai, in our conservation assets, and finally, uh, to really help our students, help our people of place, really rediscover discover the ancestor uh, the ancestral etchings on our aina ulu, and let those lands become lands of inspiration. That's what aina ulu refers to. You grow ulu is to grow, and we grow those lands in our acts of take caring for those lands, make the lands better, but they also then, in the typical Hawaiian fashion, as we flip that around in, in kauna. You know, the double meaning is that those lands become lands of inspiration for our own growth as well. And this there, this by, this thereby we will, in our division with these assets, help restore Hawaiian well-being, kind of moving beyond in, uh, the cognitive domain where Kamehameha has, has dwelled for 120 years and starting to address some of those other things, elements that affect our well-being, emotional health, material and economic well-being, social and cultural uh, uh, well-being, and physical health. Start to heal our land with visions like this for Waipa. The original plans we had for Waipa to make it contribute more to the uh, mission of the schools was really to somehow bulge out the stream, create a lake-like feature that we could then put either a resort around or resort cottages around that would produce high rents. You know, and it's the people of Hanalei, the Bahuikis and the Sprouts and those Ohana who said, that's not acceptable. That's not a place for us. It's a place that displaces us and gives us a, a trickle of cash flow back in the form of educational programs, but we have a better idea. This is their better idea, and we love it. And thereby remember who we are as Hawaiian people and, and, what, and that we are integral. This place is integral to our identity, 
And so we need to take care of this place and connect to this place in order to be who we are and have that pass on from one generation to the next. Well, thank you very much for your, your time. And